Well, hello and welcome to episode three of a five-part teaching series on the book of Romans. In this episode, we're going to address chapters 9, 10, and 11 of the book of Romans. And as we begin, just a bit of historical background review, you'll remember that the Apostle Paul, who writes this book, has actually never met the church in Rome in person, but he has heard about what's going on in the church, and the report he's received is not good. Paul has heard a report of disunity that's taking place in the church of Rome, disunity between two groups of people, Jews and Greeks, two different ethnic groups, two different cultural groups who can't get along in the same church, and here's why. They're both under the faulty assumption that they're earning God's favor and love based on their efforts and merit. So the church in Rome, both Jew and Gentiles, looking around and asking the question, who are the people in this church who are truly loved by God? Who are the ones who've done enough or not done enough to merit favor from God? And into that context, Paul writes the beautiful book of Romans where he says chapter after chapter after chapter that there's nothing you or I, there's nothing Jew or Gentile could possibly do to earn favor from God, that all of us must open our empty hands of faith and receive the favor and mercy from Almighty God free as a gift through the works and efforts of Jesus Christ. That really is the main message of the book of Romans. That's a message that's set to heart free, and that's the only message, and Paul knows it, that can bring unity between these two very different groups of people, Jews and Gentiles. Now, what we're going to see in this episode, in chapters 9, 10, and 11, is Paul continue that story as he weaves together the picture of a family tree. And he's going to graft, this is the language he uses, he's going to graft Jews and Gentiles into that family tree equally through faith, quite apart from their efforts. He's going to stick them onto it, and he's going to show them clearly that all of them came to the family tree of God the same way, through faith in the work and person of Jesus, apart from them. Now in chapter 9, as Paul begins to describe this truth, he's going to give us a really wonderful yet sometimes uncomfortable part of this story. And this is one of those parts of our faith story that I love. I absolutely believe it, but I don't understand it fully. It's one of those, I get it, God. I'm glad I got it, but I don't understand it. Right? And it's just this. In chapter 9, Paul's going to say this about the Jewish faith story and about the Gentile faith story and about your faith story and mine. He's going to say part of the reason why you've been grafted into God's family tree is because God called you. He elected you to it. He destined you to be a part of God's family. And he did that for you even before you were born so that his purpose of election might continue and so that you might know that God set his affection on you because of his goodness and character, not yours. It really doesn't have anything to do with you. He destined that to be the reality of your life before your life ever even began. I mean, I recognize that that creates more questions than it answers. It's an uncomfortable truth sometimes, but I firmly believe it, and I believe that it's far better than the alternative. If we had a God who really wasn't in control of our salvation, who really did leave it up to us in every sense to find our way to Him, that's a more difficult God to worship and a harder set of questions to be asking and answering. So as we dive into chapter 9, that's what we're going to see. And we're going to see it in a way that's somewhat hard to understand if you don't understand your Old Testament, because Paul is going to drop Old Testament reference after reference after reference to help explain this idea of God sovereignly calling people into his family tree. And he's going to begin with a person familiar to most of the Jewish community, one of the major patriarchs from the book of Genesis, Jacob. Now, Jacob was the son of Isaac the grandson of Abraham, who inherited, so to speak, the patriarchy, who inherited the authority as the firstborn of the family of Israel, even though he wasn't the oldest in his family. Now, in an Israelite culture, typically the oldest male of the family would be the one who inherit, would inherit the rights and responsibility of the firstborn from his father. But in Jacob's case, he wasn't the oldest. Esau was, yet God chose him, this is what Paul's going to say, God elected him to act as the firstborn, even though he wasn't, to make a statement to the world of what part of your salvation story looks like, that in the same way God's chosen you, even though you and I don't belong. That's the essence. Don't belong in the family tree of God. We shouldn't be there of our own natural merit. Yet God in his grace has elected us 
into that family. So that's where Paul's going in Romans 9. If you've got your Bibles, you'll see it in verse 11 as he speaks of Jacob and Esau. He says, even before they'd been born or done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose of election might continue not by works, but by his call, she, this is their mother, was told the elder shall serve the younger. Now, Paul assumes that anybody hearing this is going to say, well, now, wait a second. That doesn't sound very fair that God would do this for people who haven't done anything in response. He's just picking who he's going to bring into his family. That doesn't sound like a fair thing to me. And Paul assumes that the human heart's going to say that, which is why he says what he says in the next few verses, which in some sense make it worse when you read it just at the outset. Let's skip down to chapter 9, verse 14. What then are we to say? Is there injustice on God's part? And wait, God's just picking Jacob and he's not picking Esau. He's bringing Jacob into this family as the patriarch and not choosing Esau. What's the deal? As if Paul wants to make this easier for us in verse 15, he quotes from the Old Testament. And he's quoting from the book of Exodus, a story in verse chapter 32 through 34. It's actually the story of the golden calf. If you remember, Moses goes up on the mountain for 40 days to receive the commandments of God. And while he does, the whole Israelite community, just after being ransomed from the Exodus story, just after coming out of slavery in Egypt, they rebuild a little God that, that looks like a cow. They exalt it and they say, this is the God who brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. They return to idolatry with just a few weeks of being ransomed by the sovereign, invisible God of the universe. Now, Moses comes down off the mountain, and he sees that this has happened, and God sees that it's happened, and God says, Moses, step back from this nation because I'm going to nuke them, and I'm going to start over with you. And Moses pleads for mercy before Yahweh. He says, God, don't do it. Have mercy on this nation. And then God says this. This is what Paul's quoting in Romans 9, verse 15. It's from this Exodus story. I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So it depends not on human will or exertion, but a God who shows mercy. So a text that we read in Romans that sounds like God's this angry God saying, hey, I'm going to have mercy on whoever I want, and it's up to me, and you don't have a choice in the matter. If we look in the context of how it's seen in the Old Testament, we see clearly that what God's actually saying is, I am a merciful and gracious God, slow to anger beyond anything you could ever imagine. Look what I did for the Israelites in the Old Testament. They clearly didn't deserve my mercy. And the point is, neither do you. And neither do I. Neither did Jacob. Neither does anybody who God's ever going to graft into this family tree. We're all there because of the goodness, grace, and mercy of Almighty God, who, and this is the message of chapter 9, has called us into that reality apart from our efforts. That's a part of the mystery of the gospel. That really is good news, even though it's difficult to understand. Well, as soon as we read this in chapter 9, we fast forward to chapter 10, and in some sense, it starts to sound like Paul's talking out of both sides of his mouth here, because we've just heard in chapter 9 a very clear doctrine of election, God's sovereign predestination of those who he brings into his family. <clears throat> but in chapter 10, Paul's going to assume that people are still wrestling from this, and he's going to say, hey, don't think for a minute, minute that salvation is beyond you and impossible, because it's not. All you have to do is believe. And at the outset, this sounds like a contradictory truth, but I don't think it is, and here's why. This, the message is still the same. Look, this isn't about you. That was the message in chapter 9. This isn't about you. God called you to this. And in chapter 10, the message is still, this isn't about you. All you have to do is believe. Now, part of the confusion, discussion, theological wrestling comes in as we start trying to put these two things together. Well, wait, if God calls me and I have to believe, how do those two things fit together? And I don't have an answer. All I can tell you is they're both true. That part of your salvation story has fully to do with the fact that God called you and elected you to be in his family, period, full stop. And, not but, and part of your salvation story is that there was a moment when you heard the good news of the gospel because somebody proclaimed it to you and you lifted your heart and faith to God just like Abraham did in Genesis 15. You chose to believe, and you were made righteous. And that's the story of anyone who calls on the name of the Lord. Let's see it in Romans chapter 10, if you've got your Bibles. 
verse 6. This righteousness that comes from faith says, don't say in your heart, well, who's going to ascend to heaven? That is to bring Christ down. Or who will descend into abyss? That is to raise Christ up. This is a difficult way for Paul to say, hey, look, don't, don't say that it's impossible to be saved, that it's all God. Even though it is all God, it's not impossible to be saved. All you have to do is turn your heart to the Lord. That's what he's saying. It's not as high as heaven or as deep as the abyss. It's achievable and reachable. It's right in front of you. And that's why he says this in the next verse. What does the scripture say? The word is near you, on your lips, and in your hearts. A very familiar text in verse 9. Because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Verse 12, look, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all <clears throat> and is generous to all who call on him. Verse 13, for everyone, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So there it is, that even though part of your faith story is that God calls you into his family tree, there's another equally true part, and it's just this, that you made a choice at some point to turn your heart to Jesus. And all you do is accept with the empty hands of faith the rescue that God puts before you in the person and work of Jesus, and you're in. You call on the name of the Lord, and you're saved. So Paul's making a very clear case to both Jew and Gentile in this church, that your salvation story does not have to do with you. It's got to do with God's call that you simply respond to in faith. Now, I love the missional mandate that Paul gives at the end of chapter 10. He says, look, if this is true, if this is true that anyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved, then we've got, as a church, we've got to be about the business of going out and bringing people into this knowledge of the person and work of Jesus. Look with me in chapter 10, verse 14. How are they to call on one in whom they've never believed? And how are they to believe in one whom they've never heard? And how are they to hear without someone proclaiming to them? And how are they to proclaim unless someone is sent? Therefore, it's written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. And those feet are beautiful. The missionaries from this church, from every church, from every nation who've crossed borders, who've crossed languages, who've crossed mountains to go and bring the life-saving message of Jesus Christ to those who've never heard it, providing them an opportunity to turn their hearts towards the Lord and be saved. And all of that, every bit of human effort involved in that and every bit of mankind's choice involved in that, is somehow mysteriously wrapped up in the sovereign call of God to destine those whom he's choosing to bring into his kingdom, to call them by name even before they are born. Isn't that a mystery? That is a mystery. And that's, in fact, where Paul's going to go as we come into chapter 11. I just want to give you the end of chapter 11 right from the beginning. Paul's just going to continue to weave together the story of a family tree. We're going to see this imagery in full force in chapter 11, he's going to stick Jews and Gentiles onto this tree together, and then he's going to throw up his hands. Look, in verse 33, at the end of chapter 11, he's going to say this, Oh, the depths. Oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments. How inscrutable his ways. Who has known the mind of the Lord? And Paul's going to say, I don't get it. I'm, I'm the one that's writing this to you, and I still don't understand it. God's ways are so far beyond me, but I'm just so thankful to be a part of it. Who's been his counselor? Who's given a gift to him to receive one in return? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Hey, look, as we work out our salvation with fear and trembling, as we sort of think through how we got to this place in God's family, as we think through it theologically, we have got to put God in front of us the whole time as the good guy as the one who's done for us what we can't do, who rescues us from ourselves, and who in his mystery has knit our lives together in fellowship with people that we would otherwise have never known, never understood, and never been in the same family with. That really is a beautiful part of what it means to be a Christian, to be knit together with others in and through the person of Jesus, other people who in a natural sense, apart from what God's done for you, might even be your enemy. 
or certainly at the least would be someone with which you would not naturally be around to know. That's a beautiful picture of the church, and that's a beautiful part of the gospel. And that's where Paul's going to go in chapter 11 as he takes these two groups, remember, Jew and Gentile, <clears throat> and he brings them together, together. Not just to be um, frustratingly connected at family Thanksgiving dinners, but to be together in an everyday sense where actual love and genuine affection is cultivated as they see that they both have the same faith story, that they really are brothers and sisters in the family of Christ. So that's where Paul's going to leave us in chapter 11. Let's just look at it together as we see this illustration of a tree and its branches in chapter 11, verse 17. But if some of the branches were broken off, and you, a wild olive shoot. Now Paul's going to talk about the wild olive shoot as the Gentile or non-Jewish community who, who's coming in as a latecomer to the family tree of God, all right? You, a wild olive shoot, are grafted in in their place to share the riches of the root of the olive tree. Do not boast over the branches. Don't boast, Paul's going to say. However you got into this tree, you can't boast at all because it wasn't about you. It was about a God who put you there, whether you're Jew or Gentile. And isn't that what the church in Rome is doing? They're boasting over their own place in God's family tree based on their efforts. Paul says there's no room to boast because you're both here through God's mercy. Verse 19, you will say branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. And that is true. Paul, when Paul speaks about branches broken off, he's actually, and this is tough to understand, but he's talking about portions of the first century Jewish community who had rejected faith in Jesus, who were clinging to identity as a nation, who were clinging to their own efforts and works of the law, who were clinging to Jewish ritual. Remember, we spoke about some of this in the first episode of our study. They're clinging to these things apart from holding fast to faith in Jesus Christ. And what Paul's saying is, if you do that, if you cling to your own eth efforts, ethnicity, or works apart from Jesus, you've actually broken yourself off from God's family tree through your efforts. Your efforts haven't grafted you in, they've broken you off. That's what Paul's saying. And Paul says, in that place where some have been broken off, God's brought the Gentiles, the non-Jew. Verse 22, note then the kindness and the severity of God. Severity to those who've fallen away, those who've broken off from God's tree, clinging to their own efforts. But kindness towards you, provided that you continue in God's kindness. So here's Paul saying, look, if you want to be a part of the family tree of God, then you've just got to cling to that root. And the way you do it is just remain in Christ. You just continue to have heart and faith and love for Jesus and what he's done for you, not your efforts. Verse 23, and even those of Israel, even if they do not persist in unbelief, will be grafted in, for God has the power to graft them in again. So Paul's saying, look, salvation is open and available to anyone, Jew or Gentile, Israelite or non-Israelite. And even those who've been broken off and fallen away from the family tree of God because of their unbelief, the rejection of the person and work of Jesus, all they have to do is turn and accept that saving grace of God again and through Christ. And God will put them right back into that family tree. Verse 25, so Paul says in verse 25, so don't claim to be wiser than you are, brothers and sisters. None of you are part of this family tree because of your efforts. You're all there because of Jesus. And again, this is a great mystery. It's a tremendous truth. It's one for which we should be thankful. And it's one, as Paul throws up his hands, says, for which we should be in awe. Hey, thanks for joining us for this episode. If you're in a small group and environment, then I would invite you to talk about these things together now.